Okay, hello everyone. Welcome again to our virtual lecture series. We started this series back in March of 2021 in honor of Greece's independence bicentennial. And through the months we've been having various virtual lectures that highlight different themes on Greece's, about Greece's uh, modern history. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Dr. Stanley Spikas, who will be lecturing to us on the military junta of the late 60s and 70s, uh, the brave fight of university students that helped bring the junta down, and the return of democracy in the early 70s. So, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mikhailidis, who will introduce Dr. Spikas. And the floor is yours, Susie. Let's, um, I'm gonna ask you before we get started with that, if you could everyone mute yourselves, unless you're gonna be speaking. So just go ahead and mute. Okay, thank you, Dina. Hello, everybody again. It's very nice to see all of you and uh, it's always a pleasure, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Svikas. Dr. Svikas and I were, and Dina also, and all of us at uh, Webster, we are working for a very long time together. The most interesting things, the most creative things, the most uh, intellectual based uh, things are always connected with the lectures or presentations of everything what Dr. Svika does. We love his, uh, lectures when he is teaching. We love when he is sharing his knowledge at the conferences, which we were organizing many, many times. So Dr. Spikas is a unique, unique uh, professor uh, who, you know, it's a very rare things in our days to see a person who has this background, this intellectuality, and as soon as you say something, then immediately you know that you will get the answer and a very nice explanation. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think for the students, it's a great chance always to be in his classes. Uh, but for good students, and I think Shiran knows these things and she will agree, for good students who wants to learn. If you want to learn, Dr. Svikas is the best you have to take the classes with him because he will share with you a huge amount of the ideas, huge amount of the knowledge which you cannot sometimes find in the books. So Dr. Svikas, thank you very much again that you are always so responsive to everything what we are asking you to do in addition to everything what you are giving to us, to the students, to the university. It's always great to have you next to us. Well, and th by the way, well, those who will be next semester, Dr. Speakers will be teaching wonderful two courses for spring one and for spring two. So if you have the chance, if it is necessary, well, it is advisable not only in Athens for the students in Athens, but maybe it's also because we have uh, uh, the students coming from various campuses also to benefit from this. Thank you, Dina, Dr. Svikas, please. Thank you, Susie, for your ever so kind words. The truth is you just love philosophy <laughs> and uh, you, enjoy, you enjoy hearing it and get, and uh, so I have a very appreciative audience in you. <laughs> uh, and so thanks for that. Uh, today we're going to cover uh, the, um, the junta, you see, the, uh, the takeover of the Greek government by the military that took place uh, in 1967. And uh, I'm going to give you a, an account of it that, uh, uh, explains the causes, and uh, uh, I think the, the, one of the reasons that uh, you, you may find it particularly interesting is that the concern of the colonels, uh, once they took power, was uh, <clears throat> uh, was with the youth, the youth culture of Greece. They were fanatic about uh, 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 drugs. They didn't understand the uh, uh, 
the distinction between hard drugs and soft drugs. And so smoking pot to them was the same thing as uh, injecting heroin. And uh, e every kid that had a joint in his hand was uh, to them like the worst uh, drug uh, <laughs> abuser. Uh, you see, or the same thing as a drug lord. Uh, and so they were fanatic about that. And uh, uh, they, they, they also, I'll go into the details of it, you know, they, they hated the Beatles, uh, they hated rock music. And uh, so they, they conducted a kind of cultural war against the young people. They had strict rules about how long men's hair uh, would, would be. I came over uh, visiting at that time as an, as an academic, but, uh, I, I had, I'm, I'm bald now, but I had hair uh, just sort of like down to here. It was a, um, a bit like Bjorn Borg, the Swedish guy's uh, hairstyle I was uh, conscious of when I, was, when I had it. And, uh, uh, and somebody threw a beer can at my head from a balcony, <laughs> you see. Uh, so th there, there was this very, uh, you know, this very strict, uh, fanatic uh, and puritanical uh, um, attitude towards the whole youth, uh, the whole youth movement, and as you'll see from the um, uh, the PowerPoint now, when we go into it, I put the maxim of the junta on the right next to the title, and, and in Greek the maxim was uh, "Elas Elinon Christianon," a Greece of Greek Christians, and as you'll see, their uh, their ideological extremism took the form of a kind of uh, Hyper nationalism, and uh, if, if, but through through the uh, <coughs> uh, 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 through the perspective of uh, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, they were against uh, they uh, they were so uh, they were they were against the ancient Greek culture. You see, they were against they, they of course they uh, they were against the uh, the twelve gods and the the mythological tradition of Greece, but they were also against the Greek philosophers, uh, you know. So I'll get into it with you systematically now uh, that Dina has uh, has opened it up. So there I have the rise of the Greek uh, uh, junta. Um, okay. Uh, in terms of Greek foreign policy, two issues dominated the immediate post-war era, the Cold War and Cyprus. Constantine Karamanlis was firmly convinced that Greece's fortunes lay with the West. He was prime minister then, and that Greece had to become European. Thus, presumably, bringing to a close the long and tortured history of Greek identity. The dictates of Cold War needs led to Greece's inclusion in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. He also saw NATO membership as a means to better deal with the Cyprus situation. But Karamanlis wanted to go even further in solidifying Greece's position in the Western Bloc, he pushed for a relationship with the European Economic Community. And he won for Greece associate status beginning in 1962 and the promise of full membership in 1984. He also established a close relationship with Washington and at one point hosted a visit from President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Greece was thus firmly ensconced in the Western camp. Next page. Uh, and there you have a picture of uh, Konstantin Karamanlis. He clashed with uh, King Paul on a number of issues, and in particular, on the relationship between the monarch and the military. In a speech in 1962 to the army of Macedonia, King Paul proclaimed, God has united us. I belong to you and you belong to me. Furthermore, Karamanlis also became convinced that the military 
was exerting an unacceptable amount of power for a democratic state. And indeed, it was the case that the military had become a powerful institution within the state with its own vested interests that often were at odds with those articulated by politicians on behalf of the nation. King Paul, there you have a picture of him. Once more, the constitutional question regarding the role of the monarchy was rising to the surface of Greek political life. And as in the past, it inevitably drew the armed forces in as well. Finally, in early 1963, Karamanis found the situation unacceptable. Now I say once more here, once more the, uh, the, the role of the monarchy, the constitutional question was rising to the surface. Uh, from the, from the uh, time of Venizelos, there's been what's called the national schism, you see, between the, the monarchy uh, and the monarchists on the one hand, and then the, the, re, the, the Republicans on the other, the, those who want the Republic, who, who want the, uh, a government without the monarchy. You see, so the monarchy was, uh, was, a, was always the, the issue that uh, divided the, uh, the Greeks. And, and now that here was uh, Karamanlis as a very uh, 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 effective prime minister, but uh, he didn't have control over his own military and he's the uh, prime minister of the country, you see. And so uh, he felt the military was too strong, but as, uh, as you saw from the quote, King Paul was, uh, uh, was playing up to the military and enjoyed the fact that he had power over it. So that was a weakness in the, in, in the Greek uh, constitution, you see. Okay, the next paragraph here. Uh, I said before Kalamanlis found the situation unacceptable. His relationship with King Paul was strained. Open hostility better captures the nature of his relationship with Queen Frederica a very powerful figure in her own right, and Crown Prince Constantine. On the 17th of June, 1963, Karamanlis tendered his resignation. Upon its acceptance, he went into self-imposed exile in Paris. Now, as you might know, uh, 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 when a prime minister uh, tenders his resignation. This is a serious crisis. The government is going to fall. And, and uh, the king is, was in a position where he could have said, I don't accept your resignation. For the good of the country, I want you to stay in power. And that solution has worked many times, but the king didn't do it. The king said, fine, give it to me, <laughs> you see? And so uh, uh, the, uh, the government fell. And the verdict of history is that the king uh, uh, did harm to, to, to Greece by letting a, a, a good solid government like this uh, collapse, oh, and especially over this issue. Okay. After 1963, a number of developments came together, which led to the coup by the military in 1967. The first development was the decline in the economy. The economic bubble had burst. Inflation began to rise while wages remained stagnant. Unemployment and underemployment increased. As people's expectations of material betterment evaporated, some responded by migrating. 452,300 left Greece during these four years alone. That's half a million people practically in, in those four years. Others turned to labor unions and went on strike more frequently and in greater numbers than ever before. So of course, this was a country of constant strikes. And still others looked for political alternatives at the ballot box. Street protests and worker strikes often led to clashes with the state security forces. So there, there were many long nights of fighting in the streets like uh, as we had last night, uh, November 17th. Uh, you see, it's, it's, it was a, it's, that's something that started then. 
with, with, the, with those strikes. Next uh, slide, please, sir. Thanks. King Constantine in the photo with Queen Anna Marie. Now, King Paul died and was succeeded by his young, untried son, Constantine, in March 1964. The uh, son was totally green, inexperienced, and uh, <laughs> you see. Uh, just one month before this, the Center Union, that's a political party, had won a resounding victory, garnering 52.7% of the popular vote, which translated into 171 seats in a parliament of 300. The right was out of power. The military had lost its royal patron. Public order, in the eyes of the right at least, was deteriorating, and the likelihood of war with Turkey seemed high. <clears throat> and one reason for that was this, the, the unresolved Cyprus problem, which was at its worst then. The Papandreou government, this is George Papandreou, father of Andreas Papandreou, and George Papandreou uh, was the leader of the Center Union Party, and it was a centrist party, you see. <clears throat> and, and all right, the Papandreou government enacted a number of far reaching social and political reforms, prominent among which was the releasing of most political prisoners. To deal with the economic crises, George Papandreou appointed his son, Andreas, the former chairman of the economics department at the University of California at Berkeley as minister to the prime minister and then as the alternate minister of coordination. Many in the CU, Center Union Party, resented this move. <clears throat> so here's George Papandreou now, this uh, very popular and effective uh, <coughs> political leader, whose son, Andreas, uh, got a PhD from Harvard uh, in economics. And when he did, he went over to uh, Berkeley and then eventually became the, he became the head of the department uh, at, at Berkeley, became a star economist, you see. Uh, and we happen to know now that actually when he died, we had this huge funeral here in Greece and so on. And uh, there, were, there were many economists who came up and said that uh, he was about to be nominated for the uh, Nobel Prize in economics. And so he was really a brilliant economist. And there, there is a theory in economics called the Papandreou factor. So I just thought you, know, you should realize that he was really a good economist, but uh, the thing is that he, he had the leftist leanings. Actually, he was a, a harmless socialist. <laughs> you know, to, just like today, we have Bernie Sanders in the United States. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, and he, when he, later we discover, after this period, we discover he starts a socialist party and so on, but at the time, uh, the, the, the nation was so right wing and so paranoid and so and the military was so strong in it and so on that uh, just the whisper of uh, socialism, just as we have it sometimes in a, by the Republican Party now in America, right away they'd say, oh, this guy. Uh, and and there, there was, of course, a, this was the time of a Cold War and there was a real fear of, a, of communism. There was a real paranoia uh, about that, uh, you see. And that's what that's the reason all of this takes place with the with the uh, junta, uh, you see, and so on. The real reason the junta took place was uh, they were afraid of a communist takeover, and because George Papandreou was promoting his son, uh, all of these uh, uh, extreme right wingers became uh, uh, became very paranoid, very 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 edgy. Uh, Okay, uh, I, I had ended that last page with uh, many in the CU resented uh, this move. Now here's Konstantin Mitsotakis, the father of today's prime minister. Uh, in particular, rising stars in the party like Konstantin Mitsotakis, the future conservative party leader, felt slighted by the appointment. 
the younger Papandreou held far more radical views and he soon became involved with a group of left-leaning military officers known as Aspiva. Those of you who don't know Greek, Aspiva means the, the shield. The right viewed these developments suspiciously. Next slide. There's a, oh, it's the wrong, this is the, uh, uh, this is the other version of the, um, that's not his picture, that's Andreas right here. This is not the same uh, uh, PowerPoint, but anyway. Uh, okay, so that's supposed to, that's and, the Andreas Papandreou in, the, in, in 67. Uh, but, but ignore the name, the, the, the paragraph is valid. In the army in particular, cabals formed as once again, military men set themselves up as the protectors of the nation. When uh, George Papandreou, the father of Andreas's father, confronted the king with a demand that he be allowed to hold the portfolio of defense, as well as being prime minister, and the king refused, the constitutional question came to the forefront. In this case, it was over who controlled the military, king or prime minister. In disgust, Papandreou, Father Papandreou, resigned on uh, July 15th, 1965. A series of caretaker governments came and went in the succeeding months. Uh, <coughs> the ship of state was adrift and chaos dominated the political scene. Constantine finally called for elections in May of 1967 and an overwhelming center union victory seemed certain. Fearful of the consequences, especially a likely purge of the military of hardline right-wingers, a group of ju junior officers acted. On the morning of April 21st, 1967, Operation Prometheus was put into action and the government of Greece fell into the hands of the junta of the colonels. Now, um, this Operation Prometheus, and this is a very important fact here, was an American plan that had been taught by the uh, by America, by the CIA, uh, to the Greek uh, officers, the Greek military, to use in case of a communist uh, takeover. America was worried that if there is a takeover of Greece, uh, if there is a junta, it would be done by the communists. And in order to protect against that possibility, it, it had given a military exercise to the uh, existing uh, military uh, officers <laughs> uh, called the Prometheus uh, uh, plan about how they could quickly take over uh, where get the tanks and bring the tanks into the city center and immediately seize uh, the reins of power before the communists could. But what happened here was that the, the military uh, took, took over Greece by themselves using the American plan. And there was no communist, uh, uh, there was no attempt at a communist takeover. So the, in a way, the American plan was misused. The Prometheus plan was, was uh, abused. Next uh, slide. Yorgos Papadopoulos. He was, <laughs> he was the Greek Hitler. <laughs> uh, you know, he had the mustache too, and he was the bad guy. He, he took, he was of the colonels, he was the one that uh, was number one and he took over and he, uh, on, on movie tone news, is, uh, when you went to the Greek uh, outdoor cinemas, you'd see this guy going around uh, uh, christening uh, schools and uh, battleships and, uh, and and so on, and coming out with uh, 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 speeches that were very, uh, uh, very, very backward, <laughs> as you'll see. Uh, <clears throat> the junta, the leaders of the self-styled glorious revolution, uh, were Colonels Yorgos Papadopoulos, Nikolaos Makarezos, and Brigadier General Stylianos Patakos. 
their regime came to be called the junta or simply the colonels. The leading members of the junta were mostly officers from lower class backgrounds who had achieved career advancement through the armed forces. Many of them had previously served or were actively serving in the intelligence services, and some of them had received training in the United States. That's why a lot of anti-Americanism came out of this uh, whole experience too. Uh, you see, the Americans were blamed for a lot of this. Although in a way, America had lost control over these guys. <laughs> okay, uh, training. Uh, and there's a uh, picture of the whole row of them. Um, and the, the, the first two are um, Papadopoulos and, and Patafos, who are the most important ones. In, in, next, uh, see. A number of groups within the military were conspiring with King Constantine to overthrow or temporarily suspend democracy. The primary one that we know about involved General Yorgos Spantizakis and other high ranking officers. The colonels were part of that group. The original group had, had to do with generals uh, as well, and the colonels were part of it. But the generals uh, were, were still thinking about it, but hesitating, and the colonels were more fanatic and more aggressive, so they made their move independently. So in the next paragraph, I have it, but fearful of losing their posts because of their involvement in right-wing conspiracies, a worry that was exacerbated when the generals kept postponing the date of the coup, the colonels struck first on their own initiative. Okay. In the early hours of 21 April, 1967, tanks rolled through the streets of Athens. Some of them entered Syntagma Square and trained their weapons on the parliament. Others shut down the main arteries into and out of the city. The key communications facilities were commandeered giving the coup leaders control of the airwaves. Within a matter of hours, all of the major political figures had been detained or placed under house arrest for their own protection. The CIA trained Hellenic raiding force seized the headquarters of the Greek armed forces. The people of Athens awoke that morning to news broadcasts announcing the takeover. The revolution carried out bloodlessly marches forward to fulfillment of its manifest destiny. Greeks, pure and of a superb race, let the flowers of regeneration bloom out of the debris of the regime of falsehood." End quote. The colonels claims that they staged the coup in order to forestall a communist takeover are simply not credible. No such threat existed. Okay. They were able to succeed because of the vacuum of leadership which existed in political life at the time and because they were able to strike quickly and effectively. By seizing all of the major defense and communications facilities, they presented an unsuspecting nation with a fait accompli. As Professor Thanos Veremis scathingly notes, quote, the colonels came to power with no clear policies, no coherent ideology of their own, and no consistent views on the shape of the regime or the nature of its future options, end quote. Initially, the junta's main problem was legitimacy. And so it tried to rule through the king and the existing political system. They could find, however, very few pol politicians who would cooperate with them and immediately began to arrest prominent centrist and left-wing politicians and anyone else who showed any signs of resisting the takeover. Within a matter of days, 10,000 people were arrested 
including all of the major politicians, Prime Minister Kanelopoulos, George Papandreou, and Andreas Papandreou, for example, were arrested in nighttime raids during the coup, finding a paucity of noble politicians who would work with them, the junta looked to the king to prevent the regime from becoming an international pariah. In the days immediately after April 21st, Constantine had been approached by a number of military officers who urged him to oppose the junta by force. But his equivocation gave the coup leaders time to remove those officers from their posts and the opportunity to nip the dictatorship in the bud was lost. After that unfortunate development, Constantine cautiously agreed to cooperate. The pretense of parliamentary democracy was maintained and Constantine Polias, former prosecutor to the Supreme Court became prime minister. Next page. But power lay with the colonels who were given ministerial appointments in the Kolyas government. So Kolyas is at the figurehead and they were in, the, in his government and they were calling the shots. So that, that's how they, they did it. Once sworn into office, the new administration suspended the relevant articles of the constitution that protected civil liberties until all of the radical elements had been purged from society based upon the principle of guided democracy in may 1968 the junta appointed a constitutional commission to draft a new constitution displeased by the document drafted by this group the colonels cobbled together their own version which was ratified in a rigged plebiscite in november 1968. These moves, plus the increasing use of violence and torture to quell all opposition, were too much for the young king to tolerate. And by summer, he was openly disavowing the regime. As he told United States President Lyndon B. Johnson at a meeting in September, this is not my government. While abroad, he con Tacted many of the leading politicians like Konstantin Karamanlis, who either were already in exile or who had fled when the colonels came to power, seeking their support. Emboldened by the responses he received from leaders abroad, when he returned to Athens in the autumn, the king organized a counter coup, calling on some pro monarchy generals to mobilize a few small forces with which to seize key facilities. The king planned on making a broadcast urging the Greek people to rise up and join him. The counter coup of December, 1967 was poorly planned and even more poorly executed. It failed miserably. Constantine fled into exile. In absentia, he was deposed and after a period of time during which a regency was imposed, the monarchy was eventually abolished in 1974. So you see, when he left, they, they brought in a regent and substitute king for a while. And then, uh, and then they had this uh, rigged uh, <laughs> plebiscite where they got rid of, uh, uh, they, they abolished the monarchy. Uh, Oh, is this, you know, how ironic it was that the slide toward the final demise of royal rule was commenced not by bourgeois republicans or communist cadres, but by forces of the right, the monarchy's previous bastion of support. With the king removed and the monarchy abolished, Papavopoulos rose to the top of the regime and remained there until November, 1973. The junta's aims and policies were a curious mix of populist reforms and paternalistic authoritarianism backed up by propaganda and terror. The overarching proclaimed intent of the colonels was to purge Greek society of the moral sickness 
that had developed since the war. The symptoms of this disease were the supposed spread of communism and the failure of liberal democracy to achieve the union of Cyprus with Greece. The colonel sought to create a new Helleno-Christian state, Elas Elino Christianon, <laughs> and this goal shaped their domestic agenda. Some of their more ludicrous policies were the banning of miniskirts and the imposition of mandatory hair length for men. Most of their domestic initiatives were aimed at removing anyone whose loyalty to the regime was suspect and at forcibly indoctrinating society with their peculiar brand of messianic nationalism. The civil service was revamped and anyone who did not pass the loyalty litmus test was removed. The judiciary and the legal profession likewise were stripped of independent thinkers. Special emphasis was placed on reforming the education system. In addition to removing teachers and professors who did not tow the party line, the entire curriculum and the textbooks used in classes were revamped to reflect the colonel's politically correct view of Greece's past. While recognizing the importance of controlling the flow of information and propaganda, the junta's media philosophy was so simple as to defy analysis. <laughs> Their sloganeering was simplistic, and provided Greeks with a source of satire and jokes. Though they were by and large ineffectual in getting out their own message, the dictators were more efficient in silencing with their usual brutality, the opposition press. The first real sign of violent discontent is a bomb attack on Papadopoulos by Alexandros Panagoulis on the coastal road outside of Athens on August 13th, 1968. When the plan fails, Panagoulis is captured and imprisoned and for the next five years subjected to physical abuse as well as psychological torture. The most moving protest is the funeral of George Papandreou in November of that same year in which millions of Athenians follow the casket to the cemetery in defiance of the dictatorship. There are clashes with the police and 41 people are arrested. In between these two events, the United States announces that its aid in heavy arms will continue. In March of 1969, Nobel Prize poet George Seferis issues a public statement against the dictatorship. In August of that year, a series of bombings in Psychico target among others, the automobiles of the US military attache and other embassy and military officials. On December 10th, Greece withdraws from the Council of Europe to avoid the humiliation of being expelled. In another major event of 1969, Costa Gavras releases his film Z about the assassination of Grigoris Lambrakis. The movie has been filmed in Algeria since it obviously could not be filmed in Greece. It is nominated for a large number of top awards, including an Oscar for best picture, winning the Oscar for best foreign film, it also wins the Golden Globe for Best Foreign Language Picture and is named Best Picture by the New York Film Critics Circle Awards and National Society of Film Critics Awards. The film also is nominated for a Golden Palm Award at the Cannes Film Festival. The soundtrack by Mikis Theodorakis, who is under arrest at the time, becomes a hit record Though, of course, like the film, it is banned in Greece. 
The film ends with a list of things banned by the junta, which include the peace movement, strikes, labor unions, long hair on men, mini skirts, the peace symbol, the Beatles, Sophocles, Tolstoy, Aeschylus, Socrates, Eugene Ionesco, Sartre, Chekhov, Mark Twain, Samuel Beckett, Free Press, New Math, and the letter Z, which means he lives. <laughs> Cultural war, right? <laughs> Three developments more than all of the others brought down the kernels. The first was the student movement. The second was the global economic crisis of the early 1970s that plunged the Greek economy into turmoil, and the third was Cyprus. In January 1973, university students began to challenge the authority of the dictators. At the law school and medical school in Athens, at universities in Thess Thessaloniki and Yanina, students held protests, boycotted classes, and in other ways disrupted the higher education system. On one occasion, Papavopoulos himself called for meetings with both academics and students and made clear to them that he would never allow, quote, communists, end quote, to bring down the universities. Large-scale student demonstrations that openly defied the junta's ban on public assemblies began in October 1973, when the students occupied the Polytechnic University in Athens in November and began to broadcast on clandestine radios, calling for the people of Athens to rise up against the tyranny, the junta had to respond. They did so brutally by calling in the army the streets of Athens ran with blood as tanks crushed the gathering on the night of 17th November, 1973. The polytechnic incident showed the bankruptcy of the regime and it demonstrated that resistance was not futile. Papadopoulos was toppled from power by a coup from his own right wing. Dimitris Ioannidis, former head of the secret police, replaced him, and the junta lurched even further to the right. With this change in power, the issue of Cyprus once more took center stage. During the first six years of the junta, the relationship between the Greek leadership and Archbishop Makarios, the president of Cyprus, had become severely strained. The Cypriot leader repeatedly called for a gradual diplomatic solution to the island's bitter troubles. And so he was no supporter of the junta's hard line on unification. Moreover, the island had become, with his tacit support, a haven for opponents of the dictatorship at the same time that its president was pushing for the recall of the Greek National Guard. <clears throat> One assassination attempt was made upon Makarios, and many others were plotted, and the junta was complicit in all of them, believing that a major nationalist cause would rally the people behind him, Ioannidis, or, or that Ioannidis ordered yet another assassination attempt on Makarios. It failed, but it provided Turkey with a pretext to intervene. On July 20th, 1974, five days after the failed assassination attempt, Turkey invaded Cyprus. Turkish forces swept across the northern part of the island. Ioannidis called immediately for a full mobilization of the Greek military. Nothing happened. The regime had lost whatever base of support it had previously enjoyed. The colonels had to go. Military leaders, some of whom had escaped the earlier purges and others who in fact owed their position to the colonels, made it clear 
that they would no longer support the regime and that they were prepared to use force if necessary to expedite their removal. At home and abroad, politicians from the pre-junta parties met and debated the country's future. Two men, one in Paris and one in London, act anxiously awaited the results of the various deliberations. King Constantine and Constantine Karamanlis had been two of the leading figures in exile who had presented the Greek case to the wider world, though they had done so in very different ways. The two had met in June and decided to cooperate when the time came. The hastily convened committee of military commanders and politicians in Athens decided that only Constantinos Karamanlis possessed the ability and the level of popular support needed to dismantle the dictatorship and to restore democracy to Greece. On 24 July, the phone rang in his Paris apartment and Karamanlis received the call to return to his homeland and save it from chaos. The other Constantine sat in his London suite waiting by a phone that did not ring. The restoration of democratic rule would proceed without a king. And uh, I had some uh, photos, I think, uh, Dina, right? That's, that's the end of the uh, text, I ha but I had some. I yeah, had I don't. I'm sorry, Stan. I don't see any photos. Oh, you know what? This is not, this is the original um, version, not not the second one I sent. Oh, okay. I'll see if I can find it real quick while you're talking. All right. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> okay. Uh, there, there's one incident that I didn't write down, but. Uh, uh, it, it, it goes like this at the about the metapolitacy, the restoration of democracy. When uh, when when Turkey invaded, uh, the junta ordered the uh, generals at the at the border uh, in um, in Thaki. They ordered them to attack Turkey, and. The, the the general there said in this famous line, he said, I would sooner turn my tanks against Athens. You see, and so that that shows you that they didn't obey him and fight go to, they didn't go to war with Turkey the way the hunter was going to get us into a, a war with Turkey. Uh, and instead they were thinking that if they're going to use their power, they're going to use it to overthrow these guys. You see, and that's how uh the whole military turned, the rest of the military turned against them and uh, and they called the Const uh, Constantino Galamandi to come back. Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, the the photographs show the tanks in the that, that if they brought out when the uh, when 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 the students at the uh, at, at the Politecnio uh, rose up. And uh, you can see there was some, I, the photographs I've seen uh, show that there's a, there was a lot of street fighting that night. Since that time, I myself have uh, walked out of, uh, you know, out of a kind of uh, uh, intellectual curiosity, have walked the streets uh, doing these, uh, uh, the, these incidents, Ballon Patition and so on. and. There's a lot of Molotov cocktails that are thrown at the mat, and uh, a lot of you know a lot of street fighting in the middle of the night. <laughs> it doesn't help the fact that I have a uh, I have a bald head because they thought I looked like a guy with a shaved head walking around. And uh, when the police would look at me, I, I they come running over to get me too for they think I was one of them or something. But anyway, I, I mean I wasn't wearing a three piece suit. 
so uh, there, there is a, there's a lot of action that takes place in these streets uh, at, at night, you know, especially at, in, 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 on, you know, against the mock and what have you. And it was much worse at that, at, at that time. So uh, some, some, uh, some kids, some Greek guys got shot um, in, 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 in that night. And uh, there's uh, about the, the, the actual deaths at the Polytechnio, the photographs show a lot of students on the uh, gate, climbed up on the gate, and the, ta the tank did knock down the gate. Now, the question is, did any students get crushed or did they all jump off in time? I don't know. But we do know that uh, otherwise other people did, other protesters did die that night, if not at the Politecnio, then in the streets uh, outside. You see, it was a very violent uh, uh, night and there was a large number, there was a large number of thousands of students and other young people, a lot of protesters and the, and the whole army was, the army was out there and the police. So uh, it was total chaos, a very a horrible thing. <laughs> you see, <laughs> and uh, these are you know. So I, I try to, uh, I try to stay away from the, uh, uh, the, you know, the sensationalism and just con do a, do a kind of history with the with the causes of the uh, the causes of the of the event. So I went into a causal analysis. <laughs> Since we don't have. The photos. Yeah, sorry, Stan. I was looking for the other PowerPoint that you had sent too. I can't. It, I don't find any photos in it. Let me see if I can pull up an image, though. Um. Okay. Meanwhile, maybe some of you have some questions. Well, uh, Shiran? Yes, uh, Dr. Spikas, do you think that democracy between countries is the only solution for peace? Democracy as opposed to what? You I'm mean, saying that mean? If, if all countries would have democracy, would we have peace in the world or would it cause war? Well, you could still have war with democracies, of course, but at least at least the war would be decided uh, by by a majority. Uh, it wouldn't be just something you were dragged into by um, by a leader who, who had absolute uh, control. But there, there there have been wars, you know, between democracies. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Sarabdopoulos. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Professor Spikas. Uh, thank you for this uh, very good uh, history lesson. I have uh, the following question. You mentioned during your uh, lecture that uh, 452,300 people migrated uh, during the period of Hunda. Uh, how did this uh, affect uh, the Greek economy? Yes. Uh, do, you draw, do you draw a parallel with the brain drain that we've experienced uh, during the, the, the past uh, few years? Absolutely. And also, Very good point. And also yes. let me finish, uh, oh. please. And also, uh, do you believe that uh, the Greek economy flourished uh, during the Junta? There are some people that uh, believe that uh, during the Junta there was an economic uh, boom. Uh, is this uh, true or it's uh, just a misbelief? Yeah, I think it, the, 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 uh, <laughs> the, the record seems to show that it uh, it was not an economic uh, uh, a boom, but uh, altogether the Greek economy suffered uh, from the experience. You know.
And I found some photos if you want me to pull them up and share them. Oh, good. Um, okay, and uh, let's share screen. Can you see this? Yes. I have. Yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, you see that on the left, you have the, the, the Polytechnio, the gate there, and the students inside in great numbers. And outside there is a tank that, uh, th that tank eventually crashed into that gate, uh, you see, that we know. And then there was a general panic and the uh, students were, were, were rounded up and arrested. Of course, uh, within those gates, there was also a radio station. Mm -hmm. And the, stu the students were broadcasting from that radio station. And that, that was uh, interrupted too. Okay, I can also find some other ones if you'd like. Here's the banner that they were holding. Mm. Fighting for uh, bread, education, and freedom. Yeah, yeah. So, mi pedía el feria. You know right. what? Uh, when you hear the stories of the people at the time, the young uh, students who were uh, inside of uh, the buildings, it was a very dangerous situation. My niece, for instance, you see, was there, and uh, while her parents were well, said. Uh, well, asked her to come back home and everything, but she said, no, I have to stay with everybody else. And they stayed uh, there and it was uh, not a very, very good experience for sure. Mm -hmm. See, but this, uh, and also how the radio was working uh, with Damanaki, I think she was uh, talking on the radio at that time. Well, so it was really very, um, heroic uh, act of, uh, with the students. And that's why you see stand and you, with, that we have a kind of the celebration with the marching as we had the day before yesterday, they said that there were about 20,000 people marching uh, in the protest of all of these undemocratic things. So it was stand very, very interesting and in details, everything what you mentioned to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. and I think pe people may not know this, but the, the tank is a very powerful uh, weapon. Yeah. In, in the history of, of weaponry, at one point, the machine gun was called the ultimate weapon, and then there was a counter weapon uh, uh, to that. Uh, and then after the machine gun, the tank was called the ultimate weapon. And if you just, uh, uh, if, if, one, if the one army has one tank and the other army has a uh, uh, an, an entire uh, army unit, uh, the, the tank will win. It's a, it's a very, it, it's an unstoppable, uh, it's an unstoppable weapon. Uh, <laughs> you see, it has tremendous power. The, the guns on a tank can knock down a, a building. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's got different kinds of guns on it that revolve on a turret. But in any case, I mean, the, the idea of a tank in the city streets uh, on the battlefield, the tank would be a th tremendous threat, let alone in city streets. There's, there's, it really is overkill, uh, you know, bringing in, bringing in tanks. A whole, a whole army could, could, could be stopped. You see, un unless they're, you know, provided with anti-tank weaponry and they're a professional army. Okay. Anybody else would like to say something? I saw that some people left. Yes, Abby. Sorry, our Wi-Fi cut out, but it's back now. Um, I was kind of wondering throughout listening to this, like what their end goal was, because it seems like, yes, they have this real strong aversion to um, like a movement towards a different kind of culture for the future of Greece. And that's why there's this pushback against youth pop culture. But at the same time, it seems like they don't really have any kind of clear cut goal of where they're taking this new dictatorship. So 
was there any kind of like future plan or do you think they really just wanted to assume power and figure it out once they got it? That was perceptive of you to pick up that, uh, uh, that fact that in, in a way it was a desperation on their part. It wasn't, uh, there wasn't a clear program uh, towards any uh, ideological outcome. Uh, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a paranoid defensive act because they felt threatened so much by communism that uh, they, they were afraid of, you know, don't, they had, there had been this very bloody uh, civil war, you know, and as a result of that, they felt threatened by communists. And, and so they, uh, they did this in order to seize power. That's a good question. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, somebody else would like to say something. I say, this the always when we listen about the, this kind of fear, I think was a little bit confusing for uh, the generation that is younger than our fathers. And we listening to the stories that one story contradict to another. And we don't really, some people that they, uh, um, especially for those that rely on facts, they don't, they don't know what's going on and they rely on specific uh, events. One thing I remember was very the doubting is that if the people they killed inside or outside of the streets, inside the polytechnic or outside, it's still I, I hear today in the radio that they, they, this debate is still running that the people they are, they didn't they're not sure if uh, because the um, people are the witnesses in the streets the, the situation they saw they saw the, um, the you know the uh, the guns uh, uh, turned to the public. Uh, yeah. Thought, I got some photos for that right here. Um, uh, you know? Here's the, uh, uh, the, the Polytechnic. And in this next picture, you see how many people were out there in the streets? Uh, you see in the student rebellion photo and um, tanks. And here's another one and you see over here on the right, uh, how many students were in there? Uh, and I got some further street fighting. And I, and I was hearing stories that, you know, the people, they were very scared and they are running in, outside in the streets. Um, but I don't know really because I, won't, I never went into these details in the history, if we really, we have people that they kill inside. Um, you know, today's world is confusing also with so many information. We're trying to fight in disinformation and misinformation and we don't know clearly the past and the, rec the recent past, I think. Uh, but for me, because I was hearing very a lot of stories from my father, uh, the people they feel, feel at that time very frustrated especially this, the people that they are in the center of the, of the party. And they feel that they are like, um, um, they, they sit by the, their own people, that they, they're living, they, they, they let the, uh, George of Andrea alone. And it was like a fate to, for, the, for the government to recline. But at the same time, I see uh, also, uh, you inspired this, you inspired me some, you know, to, to try to connect some dots here. I don't know if really good or not. Here, it's, it's, I was it's, here for uh, Papandreou fu uh, funeral, you know, where the junta had given strict orders. Nobody come out on the streets. And, it, and instead, you never had such a large outflowing of, uh, of people as at that, uh, at that funeral. Everybody defied, uh, defied them and came out. To, uh, it, was a, it was very moving, this... Uh, uh, you know, this uh, loyalty to uh, uh, Papandreou, uh, you know, so uh, the, uh, things were, things were really uh, bad at that, at that time, it was a police state when, uh, I, I remember when you walked around, every 
every few blocks, some, some police would see you and stop you and shout that uh, they always hear, that's the theosas, you know, your credentials. And then you had to show them. Uh, uh, and the other thing was, one time we had gone to an outdoor cinema. Uh, uh, in a, I was in a, a family group with my uh, relatives and, and some friends of the family. And there was like six of us that had gone in as a group. We walked out together. And uh, this um, a military guy walking down the street told us uh, we have to walk. Uh, it was something like I heard about heels. We had to walk no more than two together. It was, you know, deal, deal. We had to walk. Uh, and, and he didn't want us walking as a group because we were forming a, uh, we, we, we were forming an illegal, uh, illegal assembly. They took away one of the human rights, the right of assembly, in other words. They didn't want people coming together in any kind of group. And they just, otherwise, they just enjoyed pushing people around. You know, they're constantly challenging you for your, uh, for your papers. And, uh, and so on. It was a, it was a po police state. It was an atmosphere of fear. Like you fear to to talk, to open. Uh, you fear you fear to to make some uh, art that are you know different or uh, provocative or innovative. Um, and 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 I think that I if I'm trying to to connect here that today and uh, that that era, I saw that I, I'm. I, I think that when there is a turbulence, and especially when there is an economic problem, the democracy is under under stake, uh, and we see that at the at the 2014 when we have a, a crisis and we have the golden dome, the the right you know the racism here. So we see that you know uh, yes, democracy is under the stake when we have turbulence. And uh, when, when we don't um, hear to, to the public, to the people, and we don't have a conversation and dialogue. And you, yeah, it was a sad, uh, it was a sad uh, period. Uh, but at the same time, it was very tricky. And I see now you're telling me again, you, you tell us everybody, they tried to assassinate Makarios and the Turks, the government to, to fight in Cyprus. And we're sending, uh, People, you know, our fathers, and uh, there to uh, to 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 fight in Cyprus. It was like, what's going on? That's right. That's what right. do we do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but as, as I was telling today, because it happened, Dr. Mikhailidis uh, uh, and Dr. Stikas to uh, to bring the. Uh, uh, some of their students to the two museums today, one for the Jewish Museum and the other for uh, the Holocaust uh, and the other for the War Museum. I really uh, very surprised and uh, see all people, all students, so listen so carefully to the history and asking questions and taking photos. Uh, and I have also some CDs for you um, that I, I have from the from the Jewish Museum and. For the Holocaust, uh, and I see that the, the people, the young people, they they want to know the history. They don't repeat the the black sides of it, and to go forward. Yes. Yes, it's important. That's very important. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We're so uh, so detailed uh, that even you know. I don't think so that the young people and the, the young generation, my generation, they really know what's happened. Yeah, well, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I, they, I, I don't know. I, I you know because when I was in the United States in the Greek radio, I had uh, some interviews there with a journalist mm. saying, you know, they, I don't remember now, Elias, I don't remember Dimitrakopoulos. He was uh, investigating on the issue. I I, I re really is so confused. It's so it's a, it's a, it's an it's a small area that we need to uh, clarify. I think. Yeah. I don't know. This is my feeling. Maybe it's clear for other people, but uh, I'm listening again in the radio. Says that we don't. We're not sure for this. We're not sure for that. What happened? And why? Uh, we, do, we don't. To don't celebrate this kind of. Uh, 
of, uh, of, of fight with peace? This is another question too. I don't even watch the TV yesterday because I, 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 don't like, I don't like to see things that disturb peace and democracy. So why we don't have a low key and go and you know, uh, uh, try to, respect, to pay respect to the people that they lost their, their, their lives without making noise? <laughs> this is that my concern. Okay, Tina. I think that's a very good point, all of them. And thank you, Dr. Spikas, again, for once again, a brilliant analysis of what happened during that period. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I think we should end it here. And uh, thank you, everyone, everyone to who participated. Thanks so much. Stan, you can, you can stop sharing your screen now if you want, and then I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.